Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Hey y'all, I'm Frank King, and welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and yes, hate, modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Palm Springs, California. Every February, they have a huge architecture and design festival called Modernism Week. A dazzling 10-day spectacle of architecture, martinis, lectures, art, architecture movies, parties, tours, exhibits, and the occasional plastic surgery gone awry. Our own George Smart was there talking poolside with keynote speakers, authors, and special guests during the entire week of Modernism Week. It's a tough job, but hey, I was busy, so somebody else had to do it. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from realtor Angela Roll, your highly trained special agent for bringing modernist design expertise to buyers and sellers. You can reach Angela at AngelaRoll.com, that's Roll, R-O-E-H-L, or give her a ring at 919-995-0550. Today, George welcomes Brent Harris, owner of Richard Neutra's internationally known Kaufman House in Palm Springs. Later on... Hugh Kepter, the last of the Palm Springs famed mid-century architects. Now let's go to Palm Springs. This is George Smart with U.S. Modernist Radio, coming to you from Palm Springs, California, during Modernism Week. And we are sitting in what is known as the Harris Pool House, part of the Kaufman House with Brent Harris. Brent decided back in the early 90s to take on a little fixer-upper that he has been working on ever since and is one of the foremost stewards of Richard Neutra's architecture in the world. Thanks for having us here, Brent. Thank you. Tell us the origin story of this. How did you come about to purchase this house and start the arduous process of taking it back to its roots? Well, it was a bit serendipitous, I guess, um, traveling around the area. No, knowing the desert, but... Not, not the house physically where it was. Um, everyone had studied it. I had studied an architectural history course. My wife then, Beth, had as well. But it wasn't well known other than a kind of an academic set and people who had seen that great photo by Julia Shulman from 47. So sought out to see it during a trip out here. And um, that's a minor story to itself because we were stopped by a massive deluge from seeing it the first time. So persevered and wonderfully got on the lot next door, which was empty and kind of peered at the space age louvers and thought further about it. What was the first thing you had to do when you got here and it was yours, you owned it? Well, that was a year and a half after the last part of the story. So it took quite some time to um, acquire and I wasn't quite sure I wanted to either because it was clearly a big project although not as big as it ultimately turned out to be. But in August 93, it kind of began the second stage of the restoration of the house. So what was the first stage? What did you have to do? First, did you have to rip out certain things or? Well, the first stage was, it was interesting. It was composed of a, I guess, a fork in the road. I originally thought it was of a larger variety repair project. Uh, I hadn't done this before and it it was clearly great but it was also daunting but what I subsequently found out not long thereafter was the Neutra archive showed far far more documentation than I had ever imagined and as such uh, it was kind of a wellspring uh, when the Shulman photos the the broader list that I saw in his studio not long thereafter, uh, as well as some of the Neutra archives that later were looked over really every day by Mama Redziner, who we had hired to, to uh, I guess, restore the house. Well, that term, I don't know that you'd even use, uh, but that's the best one I could think of, of how to use it at that point. I remember when I visited here last, which was about four years ago, you were telling us a story about trying to match some of the stonework here. 
and how difficult it was to do that and what you ultimately had to do to actually pull that off. Tell us that story. Yeah, it's a good one. I mean, good in the sense that it's a great story. Uh, and of course, at the time, it wasn't at all clear it was going to work. But the uh, stonework of this house, which is really quite beautiful and was one of the lures to buy it. It took a year to do, apparently, I later found out, by the same stonemasons who did Falling Water, Kaufman's other house. So this is his winter house, Falling Water, Frank Lloyd Wright, Bear Run, PA, was uh, another house he had. And then, of course, he worked in Pittsburgh in another wonderful house by Jansen. So he had three really notable architectural houses, but he was smart enough to have the stonemasons out from Falling Water. This house was done, oh, about eight years later. And they cored it, though, this time, Notre Speck in Utah. So it's Utah buff sandstone and done in a sunset pattern, which turns out to be the area that the mining equipment at that particular time was in. They still mine that vein, apparently, but it's more beige and it wouldn't fit. So not knowing anything, the first thing I said is that, well, I guess it's not the same color. you got to take the mining equipment to where you can get the stone from the Kaufman house. Little did I know, it was like two miles away. Uh, sandstones are old ancient riverbeds and somehow they agreed to do it. It's kind of amazing thinking of this now. And, and they recorded uh, an amount of it. And was this from the original vein of uh -huh. that? Okay. Yeah, I took it exactly back to, they knew where it was in 1944 or 45 when it was, was mined. I didn't, uh, they did. And of course, it's the only place you can get it, and it's not it's not a monopoly on it. And it was somewhat unusual to ask them to take mining equipment miles away and remine some small amount for some house that was highly obscure, for sure. But they agreed to do it, and then um, they mined it, and that was great. And they originally were going to cut it, and they did cut it, but they cut it in such a way that was kind of blunt and not right. And uh, so after they did all this, we actually rejected the order. Oh, wow. But, which is kind of bold, I guess, uh, given that they were the people in control of their mine and they took the mining equipment back to 1945. <laughs> but uh, yet they must have somehow, I don't know, thought this was a strange thing to do. Uh, and so I said, okay, well, just mine more of it and send it in rougher form to the property. Okay, in a rough uh, form, meaning just blocks. And at that point, I had to endeavor to find people who would know how to do this particular, uh, it's called Ashler Pitch. It's like an Indian head. Uh, you'll see it on the Glessner House, famously by Richardson in Chicago. And you can see it often in a lot of these older houses with the stone. So this Ashler Pitch was not done by anyone in the modern age. and. Um, so uh, it was really wonderful to hire Clive Christie and his team. And Clive was, you know, in his late 70s when he was doing it. And this is an old school process. And they would do on site this Ashler pitch process with a diamond saw. I still have it. I had to buy it to use it. And one linear foot a week, linear foot times of eight feet. Okay, just to give you a sense of how painstaking it was. Yeah, but to people who look at it today, it melds in well and they, they can't tell the difference. It is the same stone after all, and it's done in the same way. So success. So how did you find this guy? I mean, obviously it's not you're gonna not gonna find him on Craigslist. I mean, how do you how do you chase down a, a, someone in that kind of skill set? It's a really good question, and I didn't chase him down. This is the job of the restoration architects, Marmor and Zener, and it was credit to them to find someone to do that. That trade was hard and they were able to successfully find it and hired Clive to redo, you know, a number of things, including the chimney that's seen in the showman photo so clearly as well, uh, because it was kind of falling apart at the capstones up there as well. So I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But other than make it more amazing, there was no internet that anyone actively used there either. So there was no searching online, or if there was, I wasn't aware of it. Again, this is 1990, uh, 1994, 95, by the time we were actually implementing the, the research in the field. So it was even made harder that way. You almost think of like we did it in Morse code, I guess. Um, 
<laughs> but it all worked. It all worked. I can see you tapping out little messages to ancient stonemasons across the country. That's right. That's right. Well, apparently, you know, Kaufman himself was highly involved in this project, more, more involved than most clients uh, would be um, with, with their architect. And, you know, he had a little room back here, and he got involved in all sorts of things, and the, it shows in the files in terms of how the, the concrete color was and the mixes and the colors in the wall, his... His wife, uh, Lillian, picked an original fan, was actually found in the research as well. So we had the original pigments in the, in the archive. It's just all the stuff kind of comes together in a funny sort of way. And then it did. I think it's fair to say that this is one of the best known houses in the world. I think it's become that way kind of a second time. The Life magazine in 49 was a real thundershot in America um, in terms of showing modernism in the form of a lifestyle, both the beauty of, of this and the physical placement of it, which isn't widely talked about, but it really is because the mountains behind are 11,000 feet and create this extended twilight like that we're in right now as we, we talk. It goes on for a couple hours and, uh, and often it's snow-capped mountains too and the oddity of being in the desert with warm pools you know, it's just the juxtaposition is fantastic. And it was Coffin who picked the lot, not the architect. So he had the vision to see the space, see the mountains. It's been photographed so many times. And without, without the mountains behind and the step down of the architecture, it just wouldn't be the same place. And I encourage anyone who's seen the shot to, to kind of cover the house up and look at the beauty of the, of the mountain and realize that it was there millions of years earlier in the conception of machine in the garden. Neutra placing the Kaufman house uh, with a really great client, a really focused client, a wealthy client, to complete it. Was this the first house in the neighborhood, or were there others here ahead of it? Uh, there were a number of houses in the neighborhood, as I've seen the shots, but not, not modern or international style. Okay. Okay, they'd be more... You know, typical 30s sort of, uh, of houses, uh, one story. Not quite adobe, but, you know, done in kind of either a ranch or Mexican style. Attractive homes, but, but nothing large or grand about them. Now, we're here in Palm Springs during February, which is a great time to come, where uh, typically the temperatures get up into low 70s, maybe during the day, sometimes 80s, and maybe 50s at night. But in the summer, it can get, what, 115, 125 it here? Can. It can indeed. It's a, not really a great area to be out in the sun during the day. So what are some of the special issues of maintaining a house like this in that heat? Well, this one particularly, because there's so much glass, and it really is a glass house. It was actually done before Philip Johnson's glass house in the UK and Connecticut. So it's hard to imagine how anyone could live in this house without air conditioning. We put it in for preservation reasons, but it's just hard to imagine how it could be to live here with it without air. Um, so you were the first occupant to put in air conditioning? No. Okay. I was not. I was not. But I was going, hearkening back to Mr. Kaufman. I do know, however, because I saw it, that there was an old air conditioner in the bedroom, um, you know, poking out the wall, much like you maybe see a New York City coming out of a window or something. And so he did in later years, I believe, have air. And uh, he passed away here too, a uh, little in fact, uh, mid-April 1955. And what's also interesting about that is in the day, people would not stay out here uh, into, you know, in either end of February or end of March, that was it. And they were on to other places, Boca Raton or we're back to, back to work. And more recent years, people stay longer. But the significance of Kaufman actually being here later kind of shows that he liked this weather. And he originally built it and designed it. The program is for a 60-day use every year, January and February. Okay. And uh, I think that is how he used it in the first few years, uh, and then extending it as he got older. Now, we're sitting in the pool house which you commissioned. Uh, we're getting to look back on the Kaufman house, which is gorgeous, and the pool out in front of it. And in the background, we have the mountains, which Brent described earlier, and this twilight effect, 
which is going to go on for some time. And it's just amazingly gorgeous. It's like something you would see in one of those David Attenborough films going on. What kind of work does it take, Brent, to, to keep this place up and keep it from deteriorating over time? Because as we're looking here, it's, it's immaculate. It's, it's just excruciatingly well-preserved. Well, it looks best this way. I'm going to start there. And uh, it, it kind of demands it, you know, in its own sort of way. It doesn't talk, but it talks in its look. I guess the short answer to this, George, is that mm-hmm. we, you know, would maintain it like any, anyone would, a second residence, you know, in terms of just the general maintenance of, of such. But every so often, we have to come in and do major, major work, as we did in the last year. You know, the pool was the first thing actually done on site, apparently. Neutra was frolicking in it with his sunglasses. And it hadn't been completely, completely redone with the rebar and, the, and going into the concrete and, and fixing some basic issues from 1946, even though I did a number of them in 97. And so this, my number was up in the last year and I had to, had to do it. And uh, it's a very deep pool. It's like nine or 10 feet deep. They don't make them like that anymore. Not, not Olympic size, but pretty, pretty large and uh, concrete around it. Mm-hmm. So we had to repour it all to spec again. I did it the first time in 96. So I guess being there in 18, so 21 years later, I guess that's about what it, what it lasts. And uh, there'll be a series of those uh, over time, the orchards, the grounds, about two and a half acres or so. So, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's gardening, but it's, it's doable, I'm, I could, Clearly show. Now, um, as we were walking in the house, one of the great features that you see uh, both on the, the second level above and, and also another section of the house are these big metal louvers that are a key feature that identify the house. I understand that um, some a previous owner had taken those off or destroyed them or something by the time you got the house? Well, that's part of a house around the lily pond, that's true. The uh, up on top, known by Neutra's something called the Gloriette, which is basically closer to heaven. Uh, it, it is a term if you look it up, and he used it for this kind of outside, outside living room that's up there. And there's louvers that modulate the sun and the, uh, the wind, because the wind can be an issue in this area. And, and Kaufman and Neutra both knew it. And so they look like drapes, uh, effectively, of aluminum, which is a pretty wild material to build out of. Um, it may not seem it today. But you know they only used aluminum in the in, you know jet aircraft World War II, which is shortly followed, and so those were there. Uh, I've had to buff them and and redrill them and replace them, and they've come undone as a result of some wild uh, hurricane sort of activity that we had. Uh, so you know we're in a rugged desert, and but amazingly they survived. I think the rung you're talking about were thrown away as a result of a remodel to uh, enlarge and enhance the space for full-time living back in the 60s. Luckily, of course, it was replaceable, and I found the drawings at the original fabricators in Los Angeles. And uh, after some work, we convinced them to recommission them. This was the case like the quarry, you had to get them to build these things again? That's right. Uh, Probably a little bit easier in this case, but originally they were balking because they had moved on from 1946 when they were a small firm fabricating all sorts of things into a large commercial operation. And uh, it's maybe as exciting as this project might have been to them, you know, dollars and cents said, you know, I'm not sure, but I'm glad we persevered and and they agreed to make them and um, I laud them today uh, for contributing to the property that way. You're coming up on the 25th year of owning the house? That's right. In August of, uh, of this year. Uh, hard to believe, but yeah, 1993 to 2018 coming up. You're a relatively young man. You're going to be around here a while. Do you, do you think about the next steward? Or do, you, do you get involved in trying to figure out how to position the house for that person? Um, I don't think so, in the sense that it speaks for itself. It is Site 1 protected, which I did shortly after buying it. Tell our listeners what that means here in California. California, it's it's like, a, I guess, a historical easement. And it hadn't been well applied and not applied in Palm Springs. And so through my own education, because, you know, through all sorts of things, one can uh, 
pass away prematurely, I didn't want to do the work and see that it would be somehow uh, demolished. In fact, it was one of the things that concerned both Beth and I at the time, uh, that it might have been demoed uh, if we hadn't have, have bought it. It was out of style, out of tune, and needed a lot of work. Yes. Those are, those are the indicia of a problem for a structure to survive, no matter how noteworthy it might be. So this clearly was one that would be worthy of saving, so we didn't want to see it go you know, the other way, sometime way, way, way down the road. So I think that's really the number one thing. Uh, so I don't have that worry uh, anymore. And I think anyone in, in the future, as we sadly, we're not going to survive forever, uh, is going to inherit that and also, you know, the mantle of the stewardship because the world knows about the Kaufman House. They do. Um, I have a, an alert on my computer that puts Richard Neutra in quotes and then the word house. And almost every day, something about the Kaufman House pops up because it's, it's kind of woven into the fabric of the internet. Wherever there's an image of modern architecture or something else, boom, there's the Kaufman House. Yeah, that's been fun for me to watch. It's a vortex that kind of happens outside of living here, but it's satisfying at some level, but I just cannot believe the internet images under Kaufman Desert House or other variations of it. Tens of thousands. Uh, tens of thousands, and I remember, you know, in the early days of the internet, we just moved in and Late 97 and the pool house was done in October of 98. So those are kind of the two dates. And uh, you, know, you could get uh, wi not Wi-Fi, but I guess it was um, cable modem. It's yeah, unbelievable. AOL or uh -huh. something like that. But you needed the cable modem to get images and really get access to the web. And that didn't really come until 99. And so when that opened up, I you know started to look around and, and see that there was, you know, to me a little bit, surprising interest in, in the house. Thought it was a personal interest, but you know, not that there'd be that much. And Palm Springs it was still down and out, although starting to recover, but not nearly you know what it is as we stand here today. Now, there's a famous photo by Slim Aarons called Poolside Gossip. Uh, there were two principal ladies in it, and I think a third. It's over to the side. I know one of those ladies has passed away. And then this week, uh, Nelda Linsk was given her own star on the Palm Springs Walk of Fame. Um, I understand that photo was taken around 1970, 71? Yeah, reportedly it was taken in January of 1970, which I, I learned later. I, I, looking at the photo, you would think it would be like during a really warm time of the year. And of course, Palm Springs can be warm in January, but it's also the coldest month too. So it must have been a warm day for, for Nelda and the friends. Uh, includes Raymond Lowy, too, as the next door neighbor and the dapper guy in the ascot, if you take a look at the shot. Oh. And, uh, you know, wonderful, the Avanti and, and he had the hideaway over here. And reportedly, in, next door neighbor to Kaufman. He uh, created the Shell logo, still to this day, the Exxon logo, right there in the hideaway. So that, that was kind of a cool story. Wonderful uh, industrial designer, Raymond Lowy. And, you know, obviously next door neighbor of the Kaufmans. And, and, and then past that, too. Uh, of the Linsk as well. And uh, Elda's an old friend and was involved actually in the original transaction of buying it too, which was also fun. Uh, though she had moved out uh, shortly after the photo was taken, my understanding. Has she recreated that since then here at the house? She did, and I was really pleased to contribute to that. And it was with uh, Helen DeZozo, uh, who I didn't get to meet, but it was literally near the, I didn't know this either, near the end of her life, and she was able to come back and recreate it with Nelda in chairs in much the same way uh, that they did uh, originally. And I think there was a whole section in, where she was up on stage in the Modernism uh, event, really showing that uh, actual you know, enactment. Uh, Ellen had passed away by the time that, that that was done, so it's really quite wonderful that history was repeated years later um, w with both of them there. And she was also the wife of Hugh Kaptur. That's right. Who is one of the last living major architects here in Palm Springs. That's right. That's I went out and spoke with him this morning. Oh, how great. How great. So he'll be on the podcast here shortly. That's, that's wonderful. A lot of architects in this little tight community uh, really made it, made it important. Um, and Neutra was from the outside, L.A., not that far away. And he had done the Miller House, but he wasn't practicing here 
you know, every day. In fact, there was only three total Neutras out here, one of which has been destroyed, sadly, the Maslin House. And I did host Mrs. Maslin here once, and it was wonderful. Just the twinkle in her eye, she was in her early 90s at the time, and you could just see the pride that she had in hiring Neutra for her house, and extremely sad and, and horrible what happened uh, to it not long after her passing. Um, so it's, it's the Miller House and, and the Kaufman House uh, or Neutra's last projects here. During the 40s and 50s, Palm Springs was this magnet for celebrities to come. The famous stories of Frank Sinatra and Ava Gardner and so forth. And by the 70s, all the celebrities had basically left. But it seems like there are a few working their way back. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio bought a house here three or four years ago, the former Dinah Shore estate. And there have been a few others in the valley. Is that a resurgence, you think, or just a little blip on the radar? Well, I think it just represents what everyone's always known about it, just the intimacy, the privacy, the, the sun, the closeness to Los Angeles. It was inevitable that uh, celebrities and, and other wealthy Southern Californians were going to come back. It's not that far away. It's an hour and a half. And uh, it's closer than the Hamptons is uh, in New York. So, you know, probably 50 years from now, this will be, you know, the farthest suburb. And it'll be part of, you know, it won't be literally part of L.A., but it'll be thought of in much the same way that L.A.'s, you know, enveloped many areas. You'll be able to take an Elon Musk uh, Hyperloop between yeah, here and L.A.? Could. Perhaps you could. We, or a tunnel, yeah. a boring company. There's train service now. I wish it was better. Uh, it lands in the middle of the, of the night at an outpost in North Palm Springs. But, you know, there's, there'll, there'll be more and easier ways to get here. And the airport, of course, is great. It's done by Wexler and, you know, it's one of the most pleasurable airports. The airport is around. amazingly great. It is really, really great. It's a jewel. And we were lucky to have it. Uh, and, of course, it came about by, you know, being used by Patton to train out in the sand back in World War II. So we were lucky to have the place to, to build from. And that probably was very important in terms of the kind of more national and international appeal of it, the ability to get here in the day. Well, Brent, it's really been a pleasure to talk with you and experience this house and the pool house. Thank you so much for letting us come by. Thank you. It's been, been fun to talk. Love the Coffin House and uh, glad many other people do too. Stay with us. There's more to come from U.S. Modernist Radio at Modernism Week. This is George Smart with U.S. Modernist Radio, getting at you from Modernism Week in Palm Springs, California. Usually we are poolside somewhere, uh, sipping some delicious beverage, but today I have the honor of being in the home of Hugh Kapter, one of the iconic mid-century architects here in the Palm Springs Valley area, and one of the real greats in this area. He has a star on the Palm Springs Walk of Fame, along with other well-known architects you've heard of, like John Lautner, and most recently, Paul Williams. Thanks, Hugh, for letting me come over and visit. Okay, you're most welcome. So, tell us how you got started in your career. Oh, it started when I was a youngster. I'm one of five children. And my mother told me uh, that uh, because I was always building airplanes and things, and that uh, I was going to be the architect in the family. So, I thought about that. Oh, I might have been 10, 11, I don't know, in there. And I started taking a interest in architecture. Uh, at that time, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was still alive, and he was on TV a couple of times, and I started buying his books and things, and, um, and that's what created my interest in architecture. Did you go to school for this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to school? Back then, it was called Lawrence Tech. Uh, back in uh, a suburb of Detroit. It is now called Lawrence University. And they taught all phases of engineering from architectural, chemical, uh, industrial, mechanical, all forms of engineering that these students 
then could be hired by uh, firms in, in the Detroit area. So where did you end up after schooling? Well, um, the Korean War was pretty hot and heavy when I was in college, and uh, I was scheduled to be drafted, and we were just entering a new term in school, and I felt, well, rather than be drafted halfway through this term, I'll just join one of the armed forces, and uh, which I did. And I joined the Marine Corps, and this was in 1951. Um, I was in the Korean, the Korean theater in 1953 when the truce was finally signed. Fortunately, because if it wasn't, I may not be here giving you this interview. Yeah, so. sure. My dad was serving there at that same time. Oh, was he? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Then after I got out, the first part of 1954, while I was in the service, I got married when I was stationed at Camp Pendleton in California. And um, when I got back from overseas, uh, my wife had our first child. And I went to work for a nursery in San Clemente, California. And after about six months, I realized uh, that this was not my vocation, and I wanted to uh, get back into uh, school. So I called my father, who was a executive at General Motors Styling, and I asked him if he could, if I came back to the Detroit area, could he get me a job at GM? And he said. Son, you get back here, you've got a job. So my wife and my uh, youngest daughter, we rented a U-Haul trailer, (laughs) hooked it on our car, and um, we drove across country to Detroit. And uh, I bought a GI house back there and went back to school and went to work for General Motors Styling. Okay. So were you out at the technical center that uh, Sarnan and designed? At first, I was in one of the downtown buildings. GM Styling was scattered all over uh, downtown. We were in an old assembly plant, one of GM's plants, and the tech center was being built. And since I was interested in architecture, I was put in the tech center group where we were designing our furniture, uh, making layouts of all the different rooms and the studios and uh, where all the furniture that were drawing boards, we, we had all designed and they were all custom made. And then when the uh, tech center opened and we moved into the tech center, I think that was in 55 probably, because I resigned from my job at GM Styling in uh, 56 and moved to Palm Springs. And the reason for that move was my wife's parents had moved from San Clemente to Palm Springs, and she was a, an only child, and, and they missed her, and she was spending time here visiting them. So I think in... In June of 56, we spent a vacation here in Palm Springs, and I went around to the local architects, and they were all hiring. So uh, I took a job with Wexler and Harrison. Okay. uh, Went back to Detroit and put my house up for sale. And um, uh, when I sold it, I resigned from General Motors Styling, and uh, we moved to Palm Springs in in September of 1956. So you were the young kid on the block, right? Yeah, I was, I think, 24 years old. Yeah. 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 And Wexler and Harrison were how old about that time? Oh, they were probably 28 in there, 29. Okay. Yeah, they were, they were four or five years older than me. Okay. All of us here at Modernism Week are trying to replicate 
the late fifties and early sixties. We're we're just trying to imagine how it is with the parties and the kind of glamour and the celebrity and the cars and the food. Was it like that at the time? Well, first of all, you have to understand I was I was a newcomer, number one, with uh, a wife and a child at twenty four years old, and all that glamour that that was more for the. The hierarchy here, okay. and I was lowarchy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I did make friends. I met uh, young people my age that their families had lived here for eons. And uh, in fact, one of them just passed on at uh, eighty-six. Uh, man by the name of Don Dubos who I met. He had Uncle Don's toys store and being a model airplane builder he had a it was a hobby shop back then when he expanded he went into toys uh, but uh, before that it was strictly a hobby shop so i met don and uh, oh i met another gentleman that uh, s- still with us a gentleman by the name of frank purcell his father was one of the first I believe, Dennis here in Palm Springs. And uh, they were not born here because uh, they didn't have the facilities here back then in the 30s. So they went into Banning or into Los Angeles to give birth to their children. And that's where they were born. But then they they were raised here. So what did you do with Wexler and Harrison? Was it mostly residential or? Well, we did, uh, you know, what what they were working on. It, it was residential, but uh, it was some commercial. And, and since I was able to have some, along with my interests in architecture, I also had a talent for, uh, for drawing and so I was doing their, some of their renderings and things like that, and sketches, which they did not have the capability of. And now, I understand you're still very active. They've been designing some homes here in the last couple of years? Oh, yes. Well, we did a, a project. They named it Captor Court. Oh, nice. Yes. And uh, it was three homes. And when they were completed, they sold uh, within a short time. And... Uh, I've met two of the buyers here. Uh, we've been doing some uh, revitalization of some of my old projects that people have purchased. and We did some work on um, Toxwitz Plaza, which they now have named it Captor Plaza. Really? Okay. Yes. You're going to have everything named after you eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, at one time, they are going to name Toxwitz Oh, they were kiddingly, some of the my friends at City Hall, because I did six or seven projects on Talkwitz McCallum, and at City Hall, between themselves, they were calling it Captor Way because of the uh, many projects that I happened to do on Talkwitz McCallum. How has it been for you with this tremendous resurgence of interest in the last 20 years <clears throat> on modernism here? Well, you know, never in my life could I back then could ever imagine that we would be honored the way we've been, the architects. Uh, I mean, we were we were all hardworking, making a living to support our families. And, uh, oh, you know, I would drive by some of my projects and look and say, yeah, you did a nice job or whatever. But um, to the people back then, you'd point out to a building, what do you think of that building? Oh, that's that's nice. People back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, their interest was not in architecture. And I have to give credit where credit is due. And it wasn't until the gay community really developed in Palm Springs that uh, they took an interest in architecture. 
and they publicized it and uh, and started modernism and things like that. And uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Pat McGrew, who uh, is no longer with us, unfortunately passed on unexpectedly oh, about three years ago. And he was one of the leaders in that movement. Since then, there's been a whole group of of people who have gotten involved in in the architectural movement. And they've recognized all of us architects from that period. Uh, Bill Cody, uh, who I think was the best of all of us, <laughs> and Stu Williams, uh, Clark Frey, Chambers, Wexler and Harrison, uh, and myself. Uh, of course, I... I was a latecomer, you know, I came in the mid-50s where they were all here. In the 40s. Well, uh, Stu Williams' father came here in the 30s, I think, or late 30s or 40s. Uh, So I was, you know, I was a latecomer, and uh, and at the time, uh, well, first of all, after working for Wexler and Harrison for six months, we went into a recession, and I've got I was laid off and here here I am now. I just left a good job back in Detroit with General Motors, and I'm here with a now a pregnant wife and a child and and no job. <laughs> so um, what did you do? <laughs> I did what I the only thing I could do I I went to work out of my garage of the house I was renting. I had a, my drawing board, which I still have. There's a little story behind that drawing board, too. I went around to uh, Howard Lapham, had just come back from a sabbatical somewhere, and he was doing some work out at Thunderbird, uh, some houses and stuff, and uh, I went to see him about getting a job. And he said, Hugh, I like your work, but I don't want to hire anybody. So I'll use you on contract form. So whenever he needed a rendering of something, uh, which there were quite a few, I was doing these renderings for him. And, and then some builders heard about me. I was I was not a licensed architect then. I was a building designer. Well, then we did some houses out at the ranch club for uh, the ranch club estates. And, oh, we did some houses in Palm Desert for a a builder there. And one day uh, I met a builder that he was uh, contracted to to do a house in Deepwell for an Indian who was married to a, uh, I guess, a white man, you'd say, mm-hmm. by the name of Noel Gillette. And so I designed a, a, a home for them that was built, and they moved into, and we became very good friends. He was, funny story, I he came over to the house that I was renting, and all I knew was Gillette was coming over, and I was thinking Gillette, the razor company, uh, right? And boy, I was you know kind of anx- you know anxious. And when I opened the door, here was Noel, a guy my age. He says hi, you know. <laughs> and we became good friends after that. And and Noel himself, he worked for Desert Air Conditioning. Uh, he was a sheet metal man, do, uh, making the uh, installing the ductwork in right. homes. But Gloria was, uh, you know, one of the big tribal Indians. She was on the tribal council at the time, and of course they were able to put through their program where the Indian tribal land was given to the individual Indians and. In, these Indians were either selling their property or leasing it, and they became suddenly quite wealthy. So uh, that's how they could afford to build a house, you know. 
in the mid 1990s, you had the uh, renovation of the Kaufman House here in Palm Springs. You had the release of a bunch of different books, and then all of a sudden, Palm Springs was on everybody's lips. And then only a few years later, the Modernism Week and festivals and things like that kicked along. At that time, did did you and the other architects here kind of no, you know, I, go out for beers and no, find yourself I, amazed at this? Well, that could have been one of them. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, the very famous picture of the Kaufman House with uh, Nelda Lentz and Helen Jojo. She was married to Bill Jojo, who died in his uh, early 40s of a heart attack. Mm. And I knew Bill Jojo. He was an earth-moving contractor. In fact, he uh, he did all of the grading at Southridge and then, of course, the big estate out in Rancho Mirage. Annenberg. Uh, Annenberg Estate. He did all the grading out there. Anyway, uh, he and I became friends and... That's where I I met Helen because, you know, they were married and I was uh, married. When he died, I didn't see Helen for for years. And then through friends, we got reacquainted in 2001 and then we got married. And she's, you know, the other lady in white in that famous picture and unfortunately, she came down with ovarian cancer. Mm. Uh, oh, I think it was about 87 or so and passed away here in uh, 2015. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Now, for our listeners, let's remind them that uh, Nelda Lentz was in this famous photograph yes. at the Kaufman House called right. Poolside Gossip. Right. If you Google Poolside Gossip, this will come up immediately, and you will be able to see her. And she's still around and very active. And... Well, I was just at her star dedication yesterday. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, Well, she's... I met Nelda through Helen. Okay. Yeah. In fact... When we put our house up for sale, Helen, she kind of knew her time was going to be short. So one day uh, she said, Hugh, why don't we put this big house up for sale? We don't need the expense and stuff. So I said, okay. And so we contacted Nelda to list our house. and So she's a realtor. Yeah. She I didn't a, know that. Yeah. Yeah. She is a realtor. It was funny. Uh, no, we thought it would take months to sell. And uh, the, she called the next day and said, I have an associate I want to bring over to take a look at the house who claims he has a, good, a possible client. So I said, fine. So he came over and looked at the house and he turned and he, after he went through it, he said, uh, Hugh, uh, your house is sold. And I said, oh, sure. I chuckled, you know. He said, no, I'm serious. He said, this is exactly what my client has been looking for. And he says, I'm going to go and call him and uh, I'll get back with you later today. So later in the afternoon, he called and he said, my client has just put $100,000 into escrow. I thought, oh, my goodness, we weren't, we weren't prepared to sell our house that quickly. Well, let's get back to speaking of clients. You've had a number of celebrity clients over the years come to you for homes. Well, um, not exactly homes. I did meet um, Janet Lay and... Uh, Curtis, Curtis. Uh, yeah, through Roy Fay, he was looking at doing a, a tennis club up here and had Pancho Gonzalez at the time was going to be the head pro and they were naming it the Tony Curtis Tennis Club. Roy Fay and I, we drove into Hollywood one day and met with them and um that's how I met them, but that project never went through. Uh, Bill Holden one day called my office and set up an appointment to meet him at his home in Deepwell. 
which I was at uh, last night. Yes. And that was kind of an interesting story. When my secretary told me I was had this appointment with Bill Holden, I, who was one of my favorite actors, I was quite flustered. And so when I went up to his home and rang his doorbell, I was a bit anxious. And, uh, and Bill came to the door, he opened it, he said, Oh, come on in, Hugh. He says, I'm on the phone. I'll be with you just in a minute. Have a seat in my living room here. And it's just like we were old friends. Sure. Yeah. And, and of course, it just I just relaxed, you know. And we became good friends. And Now, the house that uh, you were in last night where they had the retro martini party? Yes. Right? Now, that... I saw it was listed as the Barrett residence. Were they the original owners or? They uh, could be the present owners. The present owners. owners. Okay. Yes. okay. Who I met, by the way, they're uh, a lovely young couple, you know. So what have you got on the drawing boards now? You got any new projects in the pipeline? Oh, uh, I've been working on a casitas for a couple by the, the last name is Ostich. And they bought a house I did in the uh, 50s up Palisades Drive. and and But that's been dragging on for a couple of years. Okay. Uh, and right now, I don't have anything other than doing a few minor things for past people who have purchased some of my past buildings. and But more consulting than actual producing construction documents. You can see the, the full range of homes by Hugh Kapter on our website at usmodernist.org. Uh, we've got pretty much everything in there since you started, Hugh, and it's been a real honor to talk with you today. Well, you'll have to show me that. <laughs> We're going to show you okay. in just a minute. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you. As always, thanks for listening. Hey, want to go to Modernism Week in Palm Springs next year and hang out with the cool kids? Plus George Smart? Send an email to george at ncmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by... Angela Roll, your special agent for Modernist Houses. You can reach her at 919-995-0550. Okay, Tomas, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org to listen to previous shows and discover our massive mid-century modernist archives. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Cindy Stratton, not a real name, researches guests from a secret underground bunker very close to Whole Foods. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Triangle Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational organization for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. Stay tuned for more shows from Modernism Week on U.S. Modernist Radio.